some of the some of his uh, his videos posted on YouTube, which I'm sure Dave's going to allude to in his introduction. I'm going to hand over to, to Dave Fuad from the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs. His introduction. Over to you. Thank you very much. So it's always great to be able to introduce somebody whose reputation precedes them, because then you don't, you know, everybody knows who they are. You've seen the advertisement of this, so. All I have to do is to remind you that he is currently head of the advisory program for ICES. And for the people that don't know what that means, it means this guy is a glutton for money. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get back to that in, in, in a minute. So we can have a little bit of fun with this. Um, Paul grew up as an overprivileged youth because he lived in Denmark. And we all know Denmark, Tivoli, uh, doesn't represent very well as a baby, he's too thin. Uh, all boys equity, uh, wonderful things that uh, Denmark has, including a very good education system. And so his, his youth was, was, uh, was, was very enjoyable. And to make up for that, he spent the next four years in Malawi, uh, working on, on a variety of issues, particularly human fisheries. But that was also where his interest in fisheries was sparked and which has basically set off the rest of his, his, uh, his career. Now, Trevor mentioned um, certain um, viral videos of, about this unassuming gentleman. And I do encourage you to take a look, just Google him and, and on YouTube, and uh, see, see what, what uh, is there. Uh, because he follows in the tradition of another great Dane, Victor Borg, who made it, you know, classical music entertaining and fun for a, for a lot of people. Um, this is a guy that has made stock assessments and presentation of advice fun and entertaining. And I think that you have to see this, this video to, 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 take, to, to pretty, truly appreciate that. Um, one of the handicaps, though, that, that he's had through life uh, and growing up in Denmark is that he had to learn and to speak and understand English. Uh, and so, you know, here's a language that, you know, if you want to say sustainability, better to educate, you know, is, is what you have to say. Do you say that very often? Probably not. So, but, you know, Den Denmark is one of the more sustainable places uh, and countries working, working towards sustainability. The thing that, though, that, that I really like and, and why, why um, you know, I, I think that he goes back uh, to these important jobs, uh, you know, presenting stock assessments to people who may not listen, certainly don't, don't uh, pay attention, and who certainly don't follow his advice, is that this has dawned on him that the really wicked problems, the really, the really tough problems, are the kinds of things that we do in the school of marine and environmental affairs. And that's working on, on how you make institutions permeable to scientific advice, and how you create institutions that, are, that, are, that will be disciplined by science. And seriously, this is what he's going to bring to us uh, this afternoon. And uh, we want to wish you a happy welcome to Seattle. Back to Seattle, and uh, the floor is now yours. Okay. Thank you very much for a very nice welcome and for inviting me here in the first place. Um, I will do my best to try to uh, expose, explain uh, some of the experiences uh, which I've been through, which we've been through in Europe regarding uh, fisheries management and especially in relation to uh, good governance in that respect and what, what it, uh, how crucial it is. Um, but actually, uh, some of you may have come into the wrong room because it will actually be about church architecture. Um, and, and just to continue from the talk about Denmark, this is a typical uh, Danish village church. And to be more specific uh, about the church architecture, it's medieval church architecture. 12 to 1400 like. And um, this is what the normal thing looks like. This is the nave, the main building, and then you have the tower here, and this is where you have the choir where the altar is. 
and this is a building where you put your swords and axes and stuff uh, which you are not supposed to kill people but once you're inside the church. Uh, so that's a medieval church in Denmark. And now here's another one. And now we are getting closer to actually the sea and to fisheries management. You'll be there in a minute, just, just take it easy. This is a church where you can see the proportions being completely wrong. This wire is this one. And the nail is this one. And to really economize, they have combined the tower and this weapons house into this thing. So either it's a very inventive architecture we have here, or something must have been going on. And here I need to tell you a story about the relations to the sea. The church is actually situated at the exit of the Baltic Sea in Scandinavia. And in the, at the time when this church was started, in the, in the middle medieval period, this was the time when a big herring stock, uh, we believe it's uh, what is now the Atlantic Scandinavian herring stock, but actually it's not quite clear which stock it was, was spreading down and was immensely uh, in high abundance in the sounds here. And it was so abundant that you could just take it up from the shore directly, or you could even, if you had an axe too many, you could just put it in the middle of the sea and it would stand upright. That was the kind of abundance of land you had at the time. And actually, um, probably this uh, marine resource is one of the reasons that the, the sound area today is one of the economic hubs in southern Europe, or uh, southern Scandinavia, and that Copenhagen is there in the first place, that there was this immensely rich resource out there. What happened? In Scandinavia, over here, it was an immensely rich community because they were basing themselves on this resource. And they started to build their church. And they started with the choir. Then the resource started to disappear. Less and less money. And the main building was now at this level. And in the end, they had to make do with this kind of uh, tower. Uh, weapons house uh, combination. So basically what this church is, is a graphic of a collapse of a fish stock. <laughs> Standing since we did at times in the middle of the, of the landscape. And, uh, and just for any hopeful students in your turn, uh, you have to do an extra effort if you want your Excel spreadsheet based graphs to stand in 800 years, visible to everybody to see what you have tried, what you have observed there. But basically, what we are seeing here is something very important uh, in, in relation to our relation to the sea and what fisheries management is all about. Okay, it's uh, it's yeah, it's becoming too yeah, the vibration. Okay, is this better? Mm -hmm. Okay, of course, the first one, the first observation is that the sea and the fisheries has always had a fundamental economic importance to human societies, at least in the coastal areas. But this has been within ever-changing marine ecosystems, and this is what we saw in this image of the church. Uh, they, all the indications are that they didn't disappear because of overfishing at the time, because and that's all uh, changing the marine ecosystem. And then, of course, today we have to say also that uh, fisheries see the subject to human impact on multiple activities, including, of course, fishers, among others. So fishers management is operating in landscape at large economic and social stakes in a changing natural environment with multiple anthropogenic impacts and in competition with other sectors and interests. And basically, we have a need of predictability that we are subject to consider the uncertainty when we're dealing with this. And the last thing is, of course, where we as scientists can have our challenges. And those of you who are into uh, the sociology of science discussion <coughs> about to think about that the combination of the large stakes and, uh, and the risks of uncertainty uh, spells something in the direction of post-normal science. But I'll return to that later. So what I'll try to do in this, in this uh, talk is to start out to uh, discuss a little bit about the development of uh, the fisheries management discourse in what I call the modern rationality mainstream, and how did we get into the place we are today? 
And then, based on the developments in Europe and our experiences there, discuss the institutional reforms to ensure responsibility and delivery on the efficient management system, which includes focusing objectives, hardline public decision making, and implementation so that long term responsibility is hardwired in institutions, and then requesting industry to take responsibility of, uh, of uh, management. These are basically the three elements of institutional reform I've been discussing. And then in the end, I will add uh, some remarks about how scientific advice actually would play in and has to play in, in uh, increasingly in relation to the development of fisheries policy. So let's just step a little bit back uh, and see how has the modern fisheries management thinking actually developed. Where does the discourse we have actually come from? The basic question which was raised more than 100 years ago in relation to fishers is that fishers, coastal communities, have always encountered a very variable availability of their resource. You can just go back to the church events to realize that this has been important, not only on the large scale uh, in, the, in the sound, but locally all over the place. And in the end of the 19th century, this was increasingly seen as a matter where policy should interfere to support coastal communities in their struggle to survive. So the basic question for policymakers at the time, and which was picked up by scientists, was why does fish abundance in the sea vary? And uh, at that time, the main emphasis was to improve fisheries. It was not a sustainability issue. It was understanding the viability in the sea to support coastal communities in their development, not to get them into a situation where they had to uh, build a different design of choice than what they actually had thought they would in the first place. And the theory which came forward first was that this is due to variation in migration. There's always the same amount of fish in the sea, but they just happen to be in different places at different times. And this was a theory which had emerged from fishermen, and it was actually the key issue at the very first conference, which uh, ISIS held shortly after it was uh, established, uh, that to study the theories about variations in migration as, as explanations for the variation in uh, fish stocks, or in local abundance of fish stocks. And to understand this, you actually need to make studies in a high resolution uh, in a spatial and time domain and just to illustrate this, I'm showing here from a book by Grant 34 about cod in the North Sea, that at the time it was felt that to understand the reasons for variability in the cod stock, you had to understand the hydrographics, the local abundances, spawning components, etc., and how they moved around depending on the hydrographic conditions. Then we got this kind of theory got into a problem because it was also a parallel process happening in the policy domain. It was the fishery, fish resources were increasingly seen as an international shared resource which had to be managed internationally on a large scale. And therefore it was realized that understanding at the large scale all the fish stocks in this level of detail is impossible. And here's a quote by, also by Graham in a book about rational fishing of the cod in the North Sea, where his bay basically saying something that the underlying idea was that you had to understand everything about all the details of the fish stocks. And then he says that the more diversity that was revealed, the less satisfactory did any simple action seem. And basically they were stuck with the immense amount of information which they could not condense into just one simple image of the sea and what to do in the policy domain. What happened as a replacement for that was an institutional development, both in science and in policy. And in science, we had the development of ISIS, where according to Graham's account of this, we got a new phenomenon where we had the combined opinion of scientists and the chosen administrators who mutually educate each other year by year at the meetings. And uh, basically this is uh, this image of a technocracy 
which decides together what is good for society. That's the kind of, of, uh, of uh, rationality we have in this. This new kind of opinion, international and exceptionally well informed, is obviously a most powerful weapon for advancing a cause such as the improvement of the fishing in the high seas. So we are seeing this international development in the science side uh, to address the issue of how do we actually uh, manage the seas uh, on, on the international scale. So basically, this image, which he was just expressing, is what we would call a modern management rationality, that societies and decisions must be based on an objective knowledge and on the principle of equal rights and values and citizens. And it assumes that you can identify objectives through some kind of democratic debate, that you can devise means by which you will meet these objectives, and it requires a professional bureaucracy which can implement on basis of formalized research how these means are best, uh, best used. And it assumes predictability and implementability in the whole system in a top-down process. And this, the implementation of this meant that in science there was a move away from the detailed understanding of populations, how they work uh, in, in space and time, uh, to a scale where the sea was seen as, seen as one large zoo and one population was the unit. Uh, the chief characteristic of this new paradigm, according to Graham again, was that research discovered and adapted the sort of scale that was necessary for the solution of the oil fishing problem. And that means that we cannot look at all the details, we have to look at populations at the large scale. And then entered a theory, a second theory for why fish stocks vary by the abundance of fish stock trade, which was actually already published earlier by Johann Jort, but which now came into the forefront as common, namely that fish stocks pay in abundance because there's variation in recruitment. And, uh, and that was a theory which was much more amenable, so to say, to the international scale of management, because you had one stock and you understood the variation in recruitment then you could explain this abundance uh, problem, which was a problem to fisheries. So it's a question of averaging over large scales uh, rather than understanding all the details. So that was an easy way out for science. We don't need all this detailed data anymore. We can just look at the last pattern, and that will give us all the responses. And that led, of course, further to uh, the concept of uh, optimization. Because then we can start to engineer fisheries policy in a way that we get the optimum out of this for society. This was actually already discussed, for instance, by Lord in the early 30s, where he is using the basic theory of, uh, of the population increase, the sigma growth curve, and, and the, what we all know that at the middle range of the population sizes, you have the highest productivity, and that's where you should harvest uh, your stock. And this was then later instituted, much more established as a theory with Bellaton and Hold in the 50s, where we got the ultimate in optimum uh, fishing uh, rationality, so to say. It was quantified and rationalized in uh, Bellaton and Hold's uh, seminal publication about the dynamics of exploited fish populations. And of course, this is one of the graphs, from, not from that actually, it's from an earlier publication, but you find similar things in. In, in the book itself, where you only have to control two factors, the uh, fishing mortality, fishing pressure here, and the size at first capture here. And then you will see that the yield surface here has, will have an optimum point here. And this is really nice. You can, you can, uh, you can manage uh, the fishery uh, for the best uh, outcomes of society on this, uh, on this uh, simple model. However, later on it became clear that uh, there is more to it, that nature is not predictable in a way, that you don't have these nice surfaces out there. And in the wider policy context, we got, in, we got the discussion about the cost approach, which was uh, highlighting the fact that uh, human interactions with nature will always be subject to uncertainty. And therefore, on the policy side, we cannot just be looking at optimization, but we also have to look at risk. We have to uh, 
uh, have uh, strategies which are uh, risk averse uh, while trying to achieve uh, benefits of society. And I'm just showing some of the documents. You know all these documents, there's a whole range of international documents which have come up with different definitions of the precautionary approach. But basically, uh, undermining this deterministic uh, uh, optimization rationality which came out of the Pemberton and Holt publication. And this is an image of, of the, one of the ways to approach this, where you, in this is the fishing mortality, this is the spawning biomass. You, in this kind of graph, showing the development of, uh, of the stock cooper pots, I think these are called these days, they've been used in ISIS for a very long time, uh, where you have these uh, precautionary buffer zones, so to say, put in between where you really don't want to be, uh, and then you put precautionary in between to ensure that as long as you are on the safe side, as long as you are below this, for instance, the fishing mortality below this safe level, then you are sure you are not up here. That's basically the result philosophy. So you cannot just optimize, you have to put risk avoidance into it. But this graph also shows that the whole issue of uh, uncertainty was addressed by uh, fishery science by internalizing it into the same kind of approach, by quantifying uncertainty by addressing uncertainty through uh, modeling frameworks which would enable us to quantify the risks involved uh, as following different management decisions. More recently, we have seen that we can now no longer discuss fisheries in isolation. We have a lot of sectors which are using the sea and they impact together the sea and each other and therefore basically the, the, move, the thing we are seeing today in Europe, and we see North America and Australia, most countries, are, in, uh, industrialized countries at least, are moving towards uh, some kind of integrated oceans management, <coughs> where fisheries management is just a part of a low-arching uh, low uh, marine management policy. And uh, basically, this is about having a kind of cross-sector ecosystem approach which are applicable across all the sectors impacting the marine seas. Um, on the larger scale, on an international scale, uh, this hasn't really been implemented yet with some success. Uh, in the EU, this is done through what is called the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, uh, and you have other approaches here and in uh, Canada. But uh, basically, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive is about the same as you see in other jurisdictions to find a balance between the two things which are healthy ecosystems and sustainable use. Some way or another to find that balance. And that is what has been defined as good environmental status in the, in the, in the European environmental countries. So what we are seeing now is actually a return to where we were in the 30s. Because in order to address, maybe I should back up closer. Um, if you want to address some of the factors which are in, in this integrated marine strategy, which is biological diversity, uh, the integrity of marine food webs, the seafloor integrity is maintained, these are just some of the elements. Then you actually need to go back and start to look at the much more detailed way. So science has to move again and say that it's fine to have these overarching groups of populations in the sea which we have been used to dealing with, but now we also have to deal with a much finer temporal and spatial scale in order to address, for instance, issues like local habitats uh, which, are, uh, which, which need protections or interference with other human activities in the sea. So we are coming full circle back, and this is one of the challenges we have to address today. So just to summarize this part of the talk, uh, the development has basically been on the management side, on the policy side, a move from assistance to develop fisheries, or at least to help coastal com communities to cope with the variability they are encountering in their resource base, towards what we could call a more societal wish to 
mitigate the overfishing problem in general and to rational fishing op optimization to have maximum benefits from the resource to society. Then later, we have seen the precautionary, precautionary principle coming in and the whole issue of how to deal with risks in this, as, in this aspect. And then most recently, we have seen that fisheries must be seen in the ecosystem context. And therefore, we have to move to integrate marine management. The research issues have changed accordingly to actually addressing these in sequence. And right now, there's a whole range of projects, activities also on the research side about how to operationalize further the ecosystem approach. And I'm sure several of you are engaged in uh, something around that. Of course, this has all been about fish. And actually, uh, this is all about people. Because the coastal communities, their problems start out with people. And, uh, and though that body of fish, fishing, fishing, fishing scientists and uh, fisheries managers, policymakers, which I'm talking about, are people. And basically, the whole thing is about how these groups can play together to achieve what they want to achieve. And here, just to go back to the kind of discourse which, uh, which had emerged and which we are still quite much into, uh, the quote again by Graham, the combined opinion of scientists and the chosen administrators who mutually integrate each other. Um, this, is, this is what Max Weber would call the iron cage of modern bureaucracy, uh, where, where you have uh, this elite who is uh, dissociated from the real life, you may say, who, know, who knows best. And basically, this modern rationality mainstream is being challenged. It has been challenged for many years, and definitely now it has been proved to be not a way forward anymore. First of all, there is one lit limitation in terms of legitimacy. This research discourse which has been developed to meet management needs has become increasingly alien to the users. Um, Ten years ago, at least, uh, when I was involved in the stock assessments uh, and advice in Europe, at that time, if you were discussing and trying to explain this to the fishermen, they would basically say that you know, this was all nonsense, this was not part of their world, and they rejected the whole outcome of this in the, in the, in the first place because they were not part of it, and they couldn't see any meaning of this. Another aspect of this is, is also a li limitation in legitimacy that the fisheries policy has been implemented as a top-down social engineering exercise, basically, um, by the chosen administrators and scientists. I mean, this is closely linked, uh, these two things together. An alien discourse, because you have a top-down and maybe even worst of all, the fisheries policy hasn't delivered sustainability, not in European fisheries, uh, through this process. And then we have implementation limitations uh, that the management predictions uh, do not predict human adaptation. And I'll come back to that, that actually human adaptations are an important uh, factor in this which has to be addressed. So basically, this these limitations, these institutional failures have been documented by a lot of research, but also just a commonsensical approach will tell you that uh, what is failing in fisheries management, wherever it is failing, uh, I'm not saying it's failing or whatever, but where it's failing is due to failing institutions rather than failing science. Um, that's what has prevented fisheries management from delivering sustainable fisheries and to gain legitimacy. And this is definitely the case for the common fisheries policy uh, of Europe. So, now the question is, how do we repair this? Can we think of institutional reform which will have our responsibility and effective delivery on the institutional level? How can we develop institutions which can achieve the objectives which are seen as legitimate by both the citizens and by the resource users. And where decisions are made on basis of the best available evidence, of course, and which can, are adaptive, which are able to adapt to changing conditions, respond to early warnings in marine ecosystems, 
and it's our aim to implement the decisions made in those institutions and take. How can we do this? And I'll now go back to the common vision policy and try to come up with three elements of institutional reform which based on the example, the lessons from Europe at least would be required to achieve these things. The common vision policy is called in all these dilemmas of what I explained about modern management rationality. It has moved from this deterministic top-down social engineering approach to support research development through the optimization uh, to now a wider concept of ensuring sustainability. Um, and we are now seeing the first move toward an integrated marine policy approach, and we are seeing the first move towards engaging more with stakeholders. So little steps have been taken. But the outcome so far has been questionable. Uh, do we have healthy marine ecosystems? Many of the stocks are, are overfished and we are barely considering the wider impacts of fisheries on marine ecosystems. Do we have a profitable and economic independent se sector? There is still overcapacity in uh, many parts of the European fleets and we have a poor economic performance. The subsidies are in some European countries larger than the land is value. Think about that. Uh, the supply of seafood to consumers are increasingly originated from outside Europe. I mean, that's fine in itself. Nobody has anything against imports of food. But it's just a symptom of the supply of fish food from the European stocks diminishing, basically. And uh, the coastal regions are not benefiting fully from fisheries. They have poor resilience because of the low profitability and uh, decreasing catch opportunities. And the cost, the, the policy hasn't been cost effective uh, and it hasn't been chosen to repeat. It's a complex and costly policy with low limitations. And these are actually limited from, I, I worked as scientific advisor in the European Commission for some years, preparing the reform of the common fisheries policy. And uh, these are images, actually the low ones from just outside my flat where I was living of, uh, of the kind of reactions you have when, uh, when uh, some of the coastal communities of fishermen are coming under pressure. And of course, this is what you see in, uh, in, in Brussels at this point. So something needs to be done. And basically, this is where we need to look at how we can institutionalize a framework which will support a long-term perspective rather than the short-term mission which has dominated to hardware responsibility. And I'll just make a little detour here because this is a picture of the Council of Ministers which is making decisions. So this is a crucial element in the institutional setup of fisheries in Europe. They don't normally meet under these glorious circumstances. You can see this is a magnificent building. It's actually a special meeting where the commissioner who is sitting up here is introducing to the ministers of fisheries, which are all these, uh, in uh, early 2009, uh, the, the Commission's uh, vision for a reform of the common fisheries policy. And yours truly is actually sitting here because I was riding the streets at the time. Um, and it was quite fun. This room has a magnificent history, and I'll just divert a bit into the history of this. This is the Bibliothek Solvay in Belgium. And it used to be the meeting place for the International Physics Association, or whatever the body was. And, uh, and it has been a framework for very important debates. This is an image from the 1927 meeting, Solvay meeting, where the main theme was a discussion between uh, Einstein and Niels Bohr about whether you have uncertainty or not. This is where Einstein is supposed to have said the famous words that God doesn't play with license. And you can see on this, uh, I think there are some uh, 13 or more uh, Nobel Prize winners here. Einstein is here. You have people like Heisenberg and uh, Dirac and uh, Bohr, of course. And for the women in the audience, uh, you would be disappointed to see only one woman here. And of course, that is what physics and natural science was at the time. But uh, just to comfort you a, a, a little, she is the only Nobel Prize winner in this magnificent team who has actually two Nobel Prizes to her. It's Marie Curie, and she had both a Nobel Prize in chemistry and in physics as the only one in this whole bunch of, uh, of people in this meeting. So you can see, 
you can see this is actually a meeting where a meeting room where you have a large intelligence reserve uh, meeting normally. And what is required actually to revise the common features policy in Europe is an intelligence reserve on that level. So we were hoping that this is what we were assembling at this uh, magnificent place, and that's why it was something like this. In the analysis of the shortcomings, uh, the institutional shortcomings of the common fisheries policy at the time. And this is something you can read in the green paper, which was published by the Commission at the time, uh, where we presented uh, these, this analysis and what needs to be addressed in the reform. These structural shortcomings include imprecise policy objectives, which result in insufficient guidance for decisions and implementation. It includes a decision-making system that encourages a short-term focus. A short-term perspective always has taken, taken over. And the industry is not given responsibility or incentive to deliver outcomes. These are three very fundamental institutional shortcomings of the European Fisheries Management System. And basically, when you add the three together, you get a very bad result out there. And that's probably why uh, one of the reasons why there has been underperformance on the European side. And if you want to move towards sustainable fisheries, we need to address these three by clear, object clear policy objectives, a decision making implementation with a long term focus, and then encouraging the industry to deliver outcomes. So I'll just start with one of these focusing the objectives, here clarifying the policy objectives. The objectives are giving poor guidance. The objectives of the common fisheries policy are saying that we should ensure exploitation and limit aquatic resources that provide sustainable economic, environmental, and social conditions. That means uh, anything goes, basically. It just says do something. Uh, <laughs> what does it mean? Um, and, and that means that there's no accountability in the system because you can make a decision and you can always say that this is in accordance with the objectives, some way or the other. So there's no guidance for decision making and there's no accountability. And of course, this is one of the results you're seeing here that if you take the biomass of fish stocks relative to the BMSY trigger, which is our BMSY parameter. You can see that a lot of stocks are below this. And if you see the fishing pattern, uh, the fishing pressure relative to FMSY, you want to be below this one. So this is the good feed with large biomass or sufficient biomass and low fishing pressure. And you have some stocks there, but you have some also in the re red region. And most of them are wrong in, or in the bad place in one of them. So this has been the outcome uh, of these kind of objectives in relation to the sustainability of fisheries, which has economic and social impacts as well, this pattern of the world fish. So in terms of focusing the policy objective, we have to realize that the compromise is to cushion immediate economic and social impacts must be compatible with long-term sustainability. And therefore, we need to make this clear, and these objectives must be associated with standards and indicators so that we can have accountability in this system. <coughs> Decision making and implementation with a long term focus. What happens in Europe is that the central de decision making is, is in a triangle between the European Parliament, the European Commission, and the Council. It's a very complex decision making system which I won't go into in detail here that would last, uh, I don't know, until autumn. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this triangle of decision making. And then they are, at that level, making all kinds of micro decisions. They're deciding everything. Uh, mesh sizes for fisheries of each and every bay in Europe. Uh, minimum mesh uh, landing sizes, etc. And these micro decisions are then sent to member states to implement. And the member states are then, of course, micro-implementing all these detailed regulations coming out of Brussels via the industry. And what we are forgetting in this process is that fishing is actually not something you can just hone within uh, a rigid scheme like that. Fishing is basically, by nature, adaptation to 
input production cost practicalities to markets for raw materials and, uh, and for markets for, for their products. They are visually adapt to the regulatory environment and to the quality of the cost of the environment. And these are perfectly rational and innovative responses in the industry side to respond, for instance, to a regulatory environment which is coming top down out of process. And what is happening is uh, something which we can call the micromanagement spire. A conservation objective is identified, and then you set up a technical measure to achieve it. For instance, that we are catching too many juveniles, and now we need to increase our size. <coughs> and then there is a little loss of catch value in the process of implementing this, and then there are technological adaptations which counter these negative economic effects. And then they reduce the conservation effect, and then we don't achieve our objectives, and then we go back and come up with a new uh, article in the technical regulation concerning how your peers should look at this feature. And this, of course, is a response. This is what you get out of this top-down personalistic management framework, which has been prevailing in the European side. And I'll just quote something. This is a quote from uh, regulation which applies to trawl fisheries in the North Sea. And in order to improve uh, selectivity, you have to put a panel, a selectivity panel, into your, into your trawl. And, um, and I'll just write out here, this is for the mathematically inclined. The panel of netting shall extend towards the posterior of the net for at least the number of meshes determined by dividing the length in meters of the beam of the net by 12 and multiplying the results by 5,400, dividing this result by the mesh size in millimeters of the small space in the panel. And the last one is really the beauty. Ignoring any decimal or other fractions in the result, because I mean, you only have full measures, right? Uh, so, <laughs> where I've tried to figure out, uh, I know the people who, who cooked this up, where this 12 and 5,400 came from, etc and nobody remembers, and you can't actually reconstruct where this is coming from in the first place. But you can understand that if even those who have made this can't really figure out what it means, uh, then it really alienates people in the industry who are subject to this, and you get this micromanagement spiral as a perfectly management adaption response to stuff like this. It goes a bit further than this. You have repair guides in legal text this is how you repair a panel like this. Uh, and you can read here, you have first to clean the hole, then you have to cover the meshes to etc. There are eight steps in this, and I don't know how one would control whether you take step, step seven before step five or something. But actually there is a regulation detailing how you repair it afterwards. And remember, all this is decided in Brussels, in a, a council of ministers like this. Uh, so, you really have this distance and a micromanagement issue. And the outcomes of this is obviously perverted technologies, uh, because you are adapting to regulatory measures more than anything. And you have no legitimacy, no compliance, increasing this paternalistic governance down to even repair guides in legal text, and you're widening the gaps between all those involved, and you don't achieve your objectives. And last but not least, it's a very complex and costly way of managing issues. So, if you go back to this, the result of this is low legitimacy, you get non-compliance, you compromise the long-term sustainability, and you basically get a problem with low legitimacy, also in the civil society or outside, because you have a cost of policy which doesn't deliver. And who wants that? So, the basic problem in this whole setup is that the highest level is making decisions from the overarching principles to micro-regulation at the same spot. And institutional theory will tell you that if you do not make any distinction between the longer term uh, perspectives and the immediate, then the immediate takes over. And this is exactly what has happened. It's predictable. It's bound to be like this. If you one day take a decision, those shall not fish behind FMS migrants, so that could be a decision. But the day after, you have to take an implementation decision for a specific fishery, and then you make an exception to the rule you just discussed. That's how it works. So the way to do it is 
to hardwire the long-term responsibility into the system by distinguishing principles from micro-regulation so that the micro-regulation decisions are bound by the higher level principles, basically. And that means putting politics in its proper place. To say ministers, parliamentarians should discuss principles, political issues, and then we <coughs> should leave the detailed management, the detailed decisions at the lower level. And that's what all this regionalization discussion is about. That's the term for that discussion in Europe. And uh, I have given you some texts which are discussing how that could be implemented. And the purpose of the whole thing is to hardwire long-term responsibility into the system. Finally, in this, I will look at how we can look at the third pillar to encourage the industry to deliver outcomes by giving and requesting the industry to take more responsibility. We could ask the question, who's at fault when a top-down micromanagement doesn't deliver what it's supposed to do? Actually, in this framework, everybody is reacting perfectly rationally within an irrational system. That's what is happening. So the problem is systemic. It's the irrational framework we should change and not uh, just, you say, blaming people for acting rationally within that framework. So basically, the solution is to change the system where it's in everybody's own interest to take responsibility and do the right thing. And how can we do that? And here I think it helps to move outside the fishery sector because we have been so used to thinking in one way of doing things that it might be useful to look at what do we do in other sectors. And uh, I'll just start out with uh, what we do in traffic. Um, this is what a road sign would look like uh, if we regulate the traffic the same way as we regulate fisheries. And this road sign is um, a Syrian words of this character, that if you have a specific model of car, <laughs> like a false part in ABC, then you can only press the accelerator down to 5.5 millimeters if it's a 1.8 meter model, right? But if it's 2.3, you should press it less clearly. And then, of course, it's a question of uh, what load you have, uh, is it uphill or downhill? And I managed to put a little bit of math in here because, of course, if you have a wind, you have to take the cosine to get the resulting force, <laughs> etc., etc. And and this is what this is what the road sign would be like if we had the same kind of micromanagement approach to traffic regulation as we have in fisheries. Um, of course, it's ridiculous because we have a very simple solution in in um, in, uh, in uh, traffic. We are not discussing the technology to do it. We are discussing the outcome in the end. And then we say it's your responsibility as a driver to apply whatever technology you place on the accelerator or whatever, and just keep within the limits set by society, and that's it. So basically, this is what we could call resource-based management. That you are not managing. The input side, you're not managing technology, you are basically managing what you are allowed to do. So, this is this is uh, what we have in traffic regulation that you can implement the technology you want, and as long as you keep within the limits, you're fine. On the environmental side, we're doing the same. Um, I don't know how it works in the US, but in Europe, uh, basically, there is a maximum permit on emissions of pollutants from industry. And then the industries are required to document that their emissions are within that. And the regulation defines the outcomes. And then they can figure out if they would have a cleaner production process or if they would put filters in the sewage pipe or whatever. I and mean, they can do what they want. But they can only uh, emit so many, so much uh, pollution as, uh, as their family is. So why is fisheries different from that? One argument is that we lack the practical means to control the outcomes. We lack understanding of which outcomes can be expected reasonably. And we have a past dependency. There's a long history of regulations of beer characteristics in beer use. And there's a precedence of the burden of proof lying on, entirely on the side of government and not on the industry. But you could say that times are changing. We have increasingly better monitoring options. We have a considerable knowledge about impacts and mitigation options. And we shouldn't feel that we are bound by history. So we could break out of this uh, and, 
and basically normalize the fishing sector so that it's managed like in other cities. So basically, I'm arguing that we should move away from micromanagement of technology to resource-based management, where it's basically the societal acceptable impacts which are the boundaries, and then it's left to the industry to develop the solutions which are meeting these requirements. And this, of course, can be linked and should be linked to a reversal of the burden of proof, or rather, and in much more increasing request to industry for them to make their case themselves uh, by demonstrating that they are within these limits, and then it's basically for society to audit this kind of information rather than having the whole burden of proof at the side of the So these were the three basic uh, uh, institutional changes, and I'll now in the end say a little bit about the changing role of science in relation to this basically releasing the science from the iron gate, sitting together with these very well-educated administrators, etc., as an elite, and running a top-down management system. We want to be elsewhere, and we want especially to be elsewhere in the new institutional framework. This modern rationality discourse is stating, basically, the philosophy there is that, philosophy, that, that policy and science are completely separate, because policy defines objectives, and science provides truth evidence-based and disinterested information. And I'm afraid that we cannot maintain this distinction because the objectives which may be societally set um, are not preempting further policy questions. Uh, independent of how uh, fine you define your objectives, you have to have discussions about what are the prioritizations regarding the trade-off between different interests what really matters to different interest groups, to different stakeholders, and what are considered the good outcomes, what are the parameters we are, we are measuring good outcomes. And another problem is that some of the objectives you get from policy may be misinformed from the outset. This is a quote from the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. The objective for biological diversity, for instance, is that the quality of assurance of habitats and the distribution and abundance of species are in line with prevailing geographic, geographic and climatic conditions. Um, if there are ecologists in the room, we immediately ask, what does this mean? Um, uh, are we talk, talking about untouched nature? And also, are we talking about an invariable nature, even without humans on Earth, we wouldn't have anything in balance with prevailing conditions because ecosystems are dynamic all the time. So I mean, it doesn't make sense. And it gets even worse in the definition of uh, the integrity of food webs because they should occur at normal abundance and diversity and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, again, what does this mean? So we have misinformed uh, objectives as well. So there is a basis and a need for dialogue between science, the science and the policy side to try to flesh out what does it mean. We can't have this isolation between objectives and truth provisions, as some are seeing and saying. We have the issue of, uh, of risk and uncertainty, which is also bringing this dialogue to the table. I don't want to get into the details of that. So the role of science to inform policy is not this image of providing exhaustive, disinterested truth, but it's rather to deliver a process of transparent, evidence-based exploration of the options which are relevant uh, so that we can help to inform societal actions. And that process should be inclusive of those concerns because otherwise we can't get the information about what are the prioritizations of trade-offs what are your preparedness to take risks, etc. So basically, this is about exploring options based on what if questions rather than a deliverance of recipients. So the core role here for times is to act as an honest broker, as a transparency dealer, rather than a provider of the solution and the truth. It's, uh, none of it exists. And this leads to a new way of delivering advice. We have seen basically until now what I would call the Vatican model. <laughs> it's, it's a black box model like when you elect a new Vatican. This will happen soon. 
this is a system table. And, uh, and this is a, a, a black box model where you don't know what's going on on the inside, and the communication is through different colors of smoke out through the chimney in the, in the system table. And this is why how scientific advice was given until at least 10 years ago in the European context. It's non transparent and it appears to be based on something like divine revelation. And the alternative, of course, should be what people call a Socratic model, which is dialogue based, exploratory, based on transparent evidence and argument. And the key words in one case is authority, and of course, in the other, it's transparency. So it's that move we have to get into as scientists contributing to these institutional changes. There are a lot of obstacles to this. And actually, I don't think I should go into details of this. There are scale issues. There's bad will out there. There's a cultural inertia. So there's a lot we have to start with in order to deal with this. I think it requires also a special uh, effort on the science, science in terms of reflectivity and transparency. We can only serve as facilitators if we are reflective and transparent about where we ourselves come from and about our own biases, and this is in two respects. We have a tendency to have what I would call a methodological tunnel vision that we know specific methods. But the problem is that a specific method also defines the questions which we can answer. And by starting from the method, you basically may actually exclude some very important issues to be addressed which should have been addressed in the first place. So there is a problem of bias in terms of preferring specific methods. And the outcome of starting with a method is not always the optimum. i just tell a little story about um, a man who had a painting and he had a violin and he went to an auction house to get a valuation of this uh, painting and this violin. And then he came back a bit later and uh, value rates in the auction house told you that I have good news and bad news. And the good news is that it's a fan block and it's a Stradivarius. The bad news is that the violin is by Van Gogh and uh, the painting is by Stradivarius. Um, and obviously, if you are a painter and try to do something else, you may not get a good question. You have to apply, you have to adapt your methodology to the question to be answered. That's the issue. If you insist on a certain methodology, you come up with something which simply doesn't work. Another type <coughs> of uh, bias we have is a, what I would call a disciplinary tunnel vision, where we have pre-cooked solutions to all problems. And you know a lot of these in visuals, we have them prominently, and, uh, and they are, I would claim, quite often into disciplines, the economists, Bets are that they will think that market is a solution to most of the problems by ITQs, catch or otherwise. Social scientists will emphasize uh, community-based management or co-management solutions. And uh, some ecologists will claim that uh, close marine areas, marine protected areas, is a universal solution to all fisheries problems. And you have seen these data in numerous papers. I don't even need to mention the examples. They are all over the place. And of course, it, it can't work this way. Uh, the solution to fisheries management is a balanced use of these different instruments according to the specific case. Sometimes, sometimes ITQs is a solution, sometimes ITQA is a solution, but sometimes you need to have a blend of other things to address the issue. And we should be open to that and not just start from our universal solution from our discipline. So, in terms of summarizing this little talk, I won't talk now, uh, the fisheries science and the concept <coughs> that we have been working with has really developed in direct response and in concert with the changing policy needs of through the last century. <coughs> and, uh, and yeah, they have much been a part of that process and subject to the limitations of that process. And this has actually created a problem for fisheries management for the institutions that we need to solve uh, the main reason for failure, where we have failure since the inadequate institutions which have been developed through this process rather than failing science. And the basic policies of institutions to deliver sustainable fisheries could be that we need some clear and focused objectives 
clear than what we have in Europe actually. And we need decision making which are decoupling the long and the short term considerations of decisions. We need to give responsibility to those who are benefiting from the resources, and that may include some reversal of the burden of proof. And we need the evidence basis, the science input, to be delivered in an exploratory and participatory process. And this process defines the role of scientists as a new known as honest global space. And uh, I think that requires quite a bit of reflectivity on the side of the scientists understanding who we are, where we come from ourselves. So basically we should be working towards not this kind of very, very strange and actually off the architecture and try to build something that is nicer for the future of the fisheries management. And this applies especially in Europe, obviously. I don't want to relate to any American issues here, I don't know enough about it. But I have tried to deal with this from the uh, European side as an example of something which I think has uh, also a wider interest in relation to uh, the institutional framework for fisheries management. Thank you. Well, there's time for a few questions. <coughs> Any questions? Thanks for coming to talk to you. It's a really fascinating history of the science and of the institutions. And, um, I guess I was wondering if you could speak quickly to you know, whatever difference in the history of these institutions that led to a different outcome in the U.S. and Australia. You know, in the U.S. it seemed like the Magnuson-Stevens Act kind of started out in the 70s being also sort of vague in its objectives. And somehow each reauthorization it got sort of more specific. You know, whereas in Europe, maybe, you know, it doesn't seem like that progress has been happening, or kind of what institutionally is shaping the difference? Um, it's, it's a long story, but uh, the, the, first of all, the political culture is very different. But I think a part of it is also that, that the European fisheries is, is more international. It's, it's, it's independent countries, which have to agree in the end. And then you end up in this kind of situation where it's very, very difficult to actually define objectives and principles on the highest level. And also, there is a great hesitation for these independent countries to give up any, any uh, you may say, any competence to Brussels. I was wondering when I was working with this in the Commission, and say, and discussing with politicians, both in Council and in Parliament, do you? Have you really spent your career to become a minister or parliamentarian to sit and discuss mess sizes in some day in Europe? I can't believe this. And there's no, actually not, but uh, we want to come back to our constituents and tell them that we have defended you. And, 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 and if that's the case, if that's where they're coming from, then it becomes very, very difficult to, to actually avoid this. And that's why, in the Green Paper at least, it was proposed to move that competence away from council and parliament and down to a regional centre in the regionalisation process. I think it's part of this that it's a completely different setting in terms of independent states which have to find a solution in Brazil. And this is also why it's difficult for us to learn from elsewhere because we are not a small island state like Iceland or Australia and we don't have the, the same setup as in the US uh, you can't quite equate uh, EU, the union level to the federal level in the US. It was quite different. And it's a long story beyond that, but yeah. yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, two two questions, both of which are impossible to answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have more <laughs> questions. <laughs> But you mentioned subsidies earlier on, and most of us in places that have arguably achieved sustainable fisheries management regard subsidies as sort of the, the, the spawn of the devil. Um, and you, know, you, you sort of mentioned it, and then it never appeared again in the talk. It, it seems to a lot of us that that is one of the key issues that drives this eternal cycle of, of short-term considerations, because you've got subsidies to pay off bad mistakes. And the other one is to follow up on Jim's question. What politician has ever volunteered to give up power? 
Well, the last one is clear. I mean, I don't need to come. I, that was what I was just explaining before. Uh, for, for the first one, yeah, I, I could go into all the details of this, but, but actually one of, the, one of the main points in, the, in this green paper I was talking about was actually that we should get rid of subsidies. And, uh, and, and even, even the subsidies for scrapping fishing vessels, which are very much in favor in Europe, are harmful. Because uh, if, if you know, if you buy a new car, you know that in five, ten years when you want to scrap it, you will have a scrap agreement. What do we do? You just buy one which is not the price. That's what happens. So it becomes a part of the investment decision. It encourages over capacity to have scrap agreements. So, uh, so unfortunately, I have heard that I'm not in process anymore. I'm not part of this. But I heard from from the, from the discussions going on and negotiations that the member states are insisting that the new CFP should include scrap agreements. So the disease continues. It seems, let's see what happens, but, but that's what I understood. Um, you mentioned that uh, it's very difficult to create or to gather lessons learned from uh, singular nations or small island developing or small island nations. But what about uh, regional fisheries management organizations such as in the Caribbean or in the South Pacific, where there are indeed different member states that have different, obviously, agendas, different timelines, all that stuff. But are, are you? Can you make some sort of comparison between the EU and some of those organizations? Yeah, you know, that, that's that's a good comparison because that's probably the closest. The, the, the regional fisheries management bodies, where you have independent states, which have to come to terms to agree on on on, on their uh, approach to sustainable fisheries in the future. <coughs> Unfortunately, most of the Arctic approach haven't quite delivered. A lot of them haven't. I mean, they get into the same kind of problems. As, They're looking for you for this too. Yeah. Yeah. One more question. I like your uh, the whole general uh, thrust and direction. It isn't even a question of sort of what's happening now to the rest of this process. But I want to ask a different question. Uh, it still seemed like in the end, uh, even though your science was transparent and Socratic, a uh, nice model, honest broker, it still seemed like it was fishery science, and, uh, which I mean biological science. And yet a lot of the underlying problems you spelled it out, and I think it's very true is you know, fisheries are important culturally and economically to a lot of people who are scared about their future. And um, social science is well, you know, not necessarily economics, but social science is a tool for understanding people and their motivations. And should that be a bigger part of the picture in the future? That should, I should have made that clear. When I'm talking about science and scientists that are science programs and this change from by science in this context, I, I mean uh, natural, social, economic science. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And, and, and if you are exploring, answering, trying to explore what if questions in terms of trade-offs, do you like what you see for this option or for this option? I, I don't see how you can analyze trade-offs without having the social, economic dimension of all as well, because that's the nature of Psychological, social, and economic systems you have to look at, and that needs all the disciplines. I'm sorry, I should have emphasized that. That's, to me, that's the base of the whole thing. Well, before we adjourn to, to wine and beer, just give one more round of applause.